In 1989, I worked as a security guard at a local Christian college. The first night on the job, I was told it was my responsibility to patrol the campus all night, make sure the main doors were locked, and to make sure that all the lights were off in the chapel and that it was locked by 11 p.m. Standard stuff. So I start walking around the campus, getting to know a few students, and just feeling everything out. When 10 came, I went to the chapel and went to the basement first. Getting to the bottom stairwell door, I realized that it won't open. I pushed on it four or five times, but the door seemed to be locked. So I go back up and out and going to the back door. The basement is all locked down, all the lights are out, and it's secure. I go over to that stairwell door, and it opens easily from the outside. I figure it's just how the door is made. I go back upstairs and go to the stage where the light switches are. I look up and I see what looks to be a kid in the balcony. I yell for him, but he doesn't answer. Oddly enough, when I get up there, I can't find him. I got a little creeped out, but I figured it was late and I'm just seeing shadows. I go back down, cut all the lights and lock up the chapel. About three in the morning, I go out for the full campus rounds just to check up on everything. Heading across the quad, I notice that the lights are on in the basement of the chapel as well as the front spotlight. I go to the basement back door and find it is still locked. I go in, cut the lights, and as soon as I do, I hear a long, loud bang in the stairwell. I run in there and up the stairs thinking I'm chasing someone, but there's no one anywhere. I go back down and leave the back door and lock it. As I walk around, I notice the spotlight is off and I check to see if it could be motion control, but it's not. Since it was my first night, I decided not to say anything, but the second night changed that. I again had weird experiences around the chapel, but on night two, I also hear weird crying and sounds in the woods on the north side of campus. I saw two strange hooded teens down on the southwest side, near where the tennis courts are. I tried to get close to them, but it always seemed like they were constantly moving 20 or 30 yards away from me. The next shift, I work, I decided to ask the guy who hired me about the weirdness. He said that one of the other guards would drop by and basically debrief me. The guard who showed up was a 300 pound man, pure muscle Cherokee. He was a beast of a man. I told him everything and he said, yep, that sounds about right. He then proceeded to tell me that everyone who worked there overnight had some experience. He said that the stairway doors do not lock, but that he himself had spent 40 minutes one locked between floors. He told me that he had thrown all his weight against both doors, but they would not move, and that every time he tried, he would hear this crazy laughter. He said he had chased what he thought were teens through the downstairs hall, just to watch them disappear. That another guard had walked into the chapel and stumbled into what looked like a sacrifice with a cult, symbols drawn on the stage, and had chased people off in cloaks, only to find that all evidence had disappeared when he came back after trying to catch the cloaked figures. All the occult symbols were constantly being found on campus. Needless to say, I didn't stay there long, When I was a child under five years old, I remember playing a game with the entity known as the Hat Man. As I grew older, I used to play it for fun without the Hat Man, so I assumed that I made it up, but looking back on it, I can't see why I would create this, and I can't see why I would create the rules that it had. The Hat Man, a tall shadow person with broad shoulders and a large frame wearing a fedora and trench coat, would be outside, and the game was in play. Once the game started, if I went outside, I knew it to be dangerous territory, and I would be unsafe if I stayed inside. It was just a fun game for both of us. It was basically just a game of hide-and-seek. I would crawl beneath the windows and pop my head out to search for him and frantically pop back down, scurry around beneath the windows. It was such a thrill, and I enjoyed playing it, and so did the hat man. It was understood by me that if I stepped foot outside during the game, he would hurt me. He never lured me outside or tried to convince me to go outside, and I think he 
enjoyed playing with me like an alt would with a kid. Just in this case, it was a shadow entity playing a game with a human child. But it was still understood and respected by both of us that I should stay inside during the game. And the rules were that if I did go outside, he would hurt me. It was nothing personal, it was just the rules. There is the possibility that I made the game up entirely on my own, although I suspect it was real because I didn't learn about shadow people until I was a teenager. And then I found out that the hat man was a real thing and was commonly seen. It was only then that I thought back to my game and considered the possibility that maybe I didn't make it up at all. And then those creepy rules. I wasn't a violent child and I didn't experience any trauma that I'm aware of. I was happy and curious and playful. I didn't see the hat man again after we moved house when I was six. I ended up introducing the game to my younger siblings, but we just pretended that someone was out there. Have you ever played a game with the shadow person? Are these things known to take an interest in kids? I wonder how many other children he's playing games with. A few years ago, I owned a recording studio in Rock Springs, Wyoming, in the basement of the old Woolworths building. My brother-in-law ran a snowboard shop up on the main floor, and the basement had a room that I used to record musicians in. This whole basement couldn't be kept lit. I would buy light bulbs every week to replace the ones that had popped. One room would stay somewhat lit, so I set up shop there. There were many experiences we had that were completely unexplainable, but one stands out above the others. I had just finished recording a band that evening and they got all packed up and left. I locked the door behind them and watched them drive away. Going back down to the studio in the basement, I went to start mixing the audio. About 20 minutes into the process, I stopped the music for just a second to adjust some things and I heard running down the stairs into the basement and then frantic running down the hallway toward my room. I had left the door open. I looked down the hallway to see what was going on, but there was absolutely nothing there. I was quite freaked out, but I really needed to get the mixes done, so I went back to work and tried hard to concentrate on the music. About five minutes later, the exact same thing happened, except this time, I ran to the call the hallway to catch the sound of the noise. So there I am, staring down this dark hallway, hearing something frantically running towards me, and I can't see anything. I checked the entire basement, which scared the crap out of me because there was only one light that was still working. The rest of the basement I found nothing and no one. I went and checked the door upstairs. It was locked. I went back to the studio and decided to put on some headphones to keep the creepiness out. Well, that didn't work at all because as I was mixing, I could feel a horribly angry presence behind me. In my mind, I could see exactly what the presence looked like. It was a very angry, bald Asian man, about 40. I kept looking behind me, but there was nothing there that I could see with the naked eye. Soon the man felt like he was standing right over me. His fists were clenched and up over his head like he was going to hit me. I turned around and saw a door down the hallway, close on its own. That was it. I was out. I packed up my studio the next week and I never went back. After studying a little bit more about the history of the area, come to find out there was what was dubbed the Chinese Massacre on the same street some hundred years ago. There were a lot of Chinese railway workers there who were killed by local folks for taking their jobs. No wonder he was so angry. So when I was little, my stepdad used to work the night shift at a gas station on the outskirts of Reno, Nevada, in a nice part of town off the highway, right before you head up to the Sierra Nevadas and Lake Tahoe. The area back then was fairly new and the Shell gas station was really nice. My stepdad never had any problems. Working the night shift, though, he did tell me some interesting characters would come and then he often had regulars that he became friends with. My stepdad was the only one in the shop when he worked the night shift and he was always told about the ghost that liked to pester the other workers like, 
turn off the lights or open or close the bathroom door, knock snacks off the shelf the works. My stepdad being the massive skeptic that he is, didn't believe any of these stories, and because nothing ever happened to him, he just brushed them off. Until one night. My stepdad is working one of the night shifts, and it's pretty quiet. He hasn't had many customers coming through other than for gas, and since it's a pay-at-the-pump kind of thing, no one comes into the store. So my stepdad is playing on his phone and frequently glances up at the doors or at the security monitor to see if anyone's coming. But the station is deserted. He turns his attention back to his gain when he hears the electronic sliding doors open and the sound of the bell above the door going off. My stepdad puts his phone down and looks up to greet the customer, but he doesn't see anyone. He calls out, but no one answers. He glances at the security camera, but he doesn't see anyone else in the shop other than him, and there are no cars at the station or in the parking lot. He gets a little weirded out since the doors have sensors, and the only time they open is if they sense someone approaching them. But he just chalks it up to a prank or some sort of malfunction and gets back to his game. Hello. He hears the voice as clear as day right in front of him and his head immediately snaps up to speak to the customer that he clearly did not see before. There's no one there. He's even more weirded out, but convinces himself that he was either imagining things or that the sound somehow came from his phone or the radio. And then he hears the screams. He said the sound of the woman screaming came out of nowhere and that the screams were so loud and so chilling, he jumped and actually dropped his phone. My stepdad is a pretty big guy, about 6'2", and a little hefty, and he doesn't normally get scared over anything. But he said the screaming terrified him so much that he couldn't think straight. He ran out from behind the counter and checked the aisles, but no one was in there. He checked the bathrooms and maintenance closet, and no one was in there. But the screams were still going, and they were definitely loud. So he thinks well, maybe there's a woman outside who might be heard or being attacked. He runs outside where he thinks the screaming woman is, and there's no one. The lot is empty. There are no people, no cars, nothing. He checks around the back of the store and does a loop, but he can't find the source of the screaming. And just as suddenly as a screaming it started, it stopped. He goes back inside and checks the security tapes to see if he's missing something, but other than him running inside and outside of the store like an idiot, he doesn't see anything else, and he's completely unsure of what to think. The next day, as he's leaving work and his co-worker takes over, he tells them about what happened. Brushing it off is just some weird praying. But the co-worker's response was very different, and even though my stepdad doesn't believe in any sort of paranormal activity, the word stuck with him. The co-worker co-worker looked up at him and said, oh, so you've heard her too. When I was younger, I used to see the shadow man in my doorway almost every single night. I have always had sleeping issues, so when I would wake up in the middle of the night, I could see a figure darker than the dark, darker than everything else around it, standing in my doorway. He would never come in, but he would kind of peek around the corner, switching from hiding right out of view and then allowing half of his body to be seen. I was around seven or eight at the time, and this went on for probably around a year. He was taller and thinner than my dad, so I know it wasn't him. As an adult, I have tried to explain this and found shadow people. However, this guy didn't have a hat, and I don't think he was mean. At first, he scared me, but eventually I got used to him. I also want to note that I didn't see him out of the corner of my eye. I would stare dead at him for like 15 to 20 minutes, as a time at a time, as he rocked from hiding to peeking, hiding to peeking. I also wasn't in sleep paralysis because I could move and sit up at will. Soon after I started seeing this man, I would also wake up and hear someone calling me, but it wasn't a voice, it was kind of like a whisper yell, if that makes sense, so I couldn't tell who it was. At first I thought it was my mom, so I went to her room, but 
when I did, everybody would be asleep. That would happen about once a week, and I would get up out of bed and try to follow it where I thought it was leading me. One time, I was LED to the living room, where I would stand for like 20 minutes, just waiting to hear this voice again. When I didn't hear it, I'd go back to my room. It's kind of funny that it didn't scare me back then, because looking back at it, it's pretty weird. I want to say, I lived in this house eight or nine years ago. I was a senior in high school, and I'm 25 now. I honestly don't think my sisters or parents knew about this man hanging himself on the front porch of our house until after the experience that my sister and I had. Let me give you some backstory. My sister could see ghosts, and I, on the other hand, have seen ghosts of people that I knew, but my sister was on another level. She could see ghosts of people we didn't know and talk to them. One night, it was kind of late, maybe 11 or 12-ish, I don't quite remember. We were looking outside the window, and my sister kept saying that she saw a man at the fence line. My parents looked and couldn't see anything, so they didn't really have any concern as they thought she was just trying to scare everybody. We continue to go on with our night. When my sister keeps looking out the window, and sees him again. She gets up, opens the door, and begins to walk outside. My friend and her friend and I, who were all staying there together that night, followed her out. She goes to the exact spot where she kept saying that she had seen him and begins talking. She finds out his name and what happened and asks if he will show himself to me so that I would believe her. It's not that I didn't believe her because I did. I just couldn't see him. All of a sudden, I'm looking at him, and I can see him. He begins to tell me what he told my sister about how he killed himself on our front porch and what his name is. He said he didn't want to hurt us, but that every now and then he appears to check on the house and the people living inside. He said he's not out to hurt anyone. But since his family, his family owns the house still, and he likes to look out for them if they ever come to the house. Back in middle school, there was a windstorm that took out a lot of my town's power for a period of about a week or so, because electricity did not work. School was also canceled for a bit. And during the nighttime, my family and I would just go to bed early and use flashlights and candles to light things up. During one of these nights, I woke up, and for some reason I had a gut feeling to look at the doorway to my room, which I always kept open. Suddenly, a tall figure moved into the doorway and stood still. Its arms were unproportionately long and were waving around. Kind of like when you view something in a pool, how it appears to move around. But this time, I was wide awake because of terror, which had taken the best of me. The figure looked basically two-dimensional and completely black. I stared back at it for what felt like forever since I didn't want to look away, and I was terrified. At one point I even shouted, go away, leave me alone. Eventually I grabbed a flashlight, I kept it right next to my side table since a lamp didn't work, and I shone it at the doorway, and it was gone. Cliché, I know, but that's what happened. I turned the flashlight off, and it was still gone. But I spent the rest of that entire night awake and terrified. I still can't explain. It was hallucination. It definitely wasn't a dream because seeing the figure appeared to put me in a bit of shell shock state, and I was definitely awake. An interesting thing to note is that this was during the whole Slenderman fad that was going on, so that's what it looked like to me. Also, I sometimes hear about shadow people, but to me that's kind of a fad. I don't know if this experience is something real, if shadow people are real, or if it was just my mind playing tricks on me. Either way, I don't know how to explain it. This is a story of my father's that he recounted to me when he was on assignment in Mexico City with a few other judicial officers. One thing you should know, when my father was young, he wasn't really much for believing in the paranormal, but this incident certainly had him scratching his head. He was in the center of Mexico City, El Central. 
when he and three friends happened to be walking by what looked like a beautiful European woman with blonde hair and blue eyes dressed in what seemed to be traditional gypsy clothing. He met the eyes of the woman as she approached him and went to grab his hand. He was a little put off, but he let it happen. She asked him if she could give him a palm reading, and before my father said anything, she insisted that he didn't need to pay her. My dad was reluctant to accept, but his friends were aging him on to do it, so they gathered around, simply listened with amusement as she began to speak. She read his palm and told him things of his life that she otherwise would not have known. She spoke of his childhood, how he grew up without the love of his father, and how he craved the attention of his mother but never got it. How he cared for his siblings as a parent when he could barely take care of himself. How he lived a hard life on the streets. It was at this point that the giggles and amusement turned to interest and attention as they looked at my dad to elaborate on any of this or to confirm that it was true. He couldn't muster the words through his confusion. When the woman went on once more as my father listened in disbelief to say something quite interesting. She said, he could never be harmed by black magic, voodoo, or anything else, that bad energies and entities were warded off by his presence because of his Venus Crusadas, crossed veins. She said that, he would live a long and good life because he walked hand in hand in the grace of God. See, my father had never been the religious type because of how hard his upbringing was. So this was strange to him. She asked, have you ever seen a ghost or a demon? And my father said no, he had only ever heard of such things from others. But of course this doesn't prove anything. She finishes with my dad and does, his friend, to which she doesn't have much interesting to say. She begins wishing them a good afternoon and was ready to leave when my father offered him some her some money, but she kindly refused. Instead, she insisted that they go around the corner and get the two other friends' readings from a member of her family as they too were like her. They were headed that way, so they said, sure, why not? So they turn the corner and see some woman dressed in similar clothing as the one who gave my dad a reading. And before they could say anything, one of the women goes, who are the two that didn't get a reading? My father thought it was a little weird that she knew two of them already had gotten a reading. She did his friends and one of them who was nicknamed Tokyo got a bad reading. She told him his life would be cut off shorter than what he expected and to cherish what life he had left. They went on with their day, assuming it was amusing, but creepy. That was until a year and a half later when Tokyo had died in a shootout, and that's when my father remembered the gypsy woman and what she had said. That was the day that he really started to believe in things like that. How else would she have known? I don't know. Much more about Venus Crusadas apart from my father's experience. I don't know that I want to. This happened a few months ago, and it was the most terrifying night of my life. My son is two, and occasionally he hops into bed with me in the middle of the night. It was about midnight when I get hit with sleep paralysis. I'm fully aware of my surroundings, but I cannot move or scream. I'm sleeping on my back, and I can see my son next to me asleep, in the doorway to my right. I see this shadow, definitely a human figure, but he's wearing a cloak with a hood over his head. He was so dark, I couldn't see his face. He slowly floats to the right side of the bed where my son is sleeping and just stands there, inches away from him, watching him. I begin to panic and struggle with every ounce of my being to throw myself over my son to protect him, but I'm unable to. My body felt so heavy and I felt so weak. I tried to scream, but I couldn't. It felt like an eternity of struggle when my son started to cry. The figure disappeared, and I snapped out of it. I got my son back to sleep and calmed myself down enough to get out of bed and make sure there was no one in our house. I found nothing, so I hopped back in bed and fell asleep. An hour later, I'm hit again with sleep paralysis. Immediately I looked at the door, and there he is again. This time, he floats over to the foot of the bed, 
and waits there for a second. He then gets on the bed and is right at my son's feet, sitting there, watching him. I struggle to move or scream, but I can't. Shadow Man turns his head in my direction, and almost immediately my son starts crying. The Shadow Man disappears. I get him back to sleep and hold him in my arms, and eventually fell asleep once more. Two hours later, now it's about four in the morning, another round of sleep paralysis hits me. And this time I know what's coming, my son is still in my arms asleep, but I feel ready and calm. But this time, I see the Shadow Man and two other figures in the opposite corner of the room. They're conversing with each other, but I can't hear them. Two of them disappear, and the Shadow Man stands there for a second. Then he comes flying at me, full speed. He shoves me off the bed, and I swear I felt his hands on me with incredible force. My son starts crying, I'm fully awake and a panic, and the Shadow Man is gone. I gave up on sleep for the rest of that night. My son fell asleep on my lap, and I just sat there with the bedside lamp on. Four months later, and I haven't had any more encounters, but have since gotten sleep paralysis more frequently. But man, I've never in my life felt more terrified and desperate than I did that night. I don't know if he had bad intentions towards my son, but he definitely didn't like my trying to interfere with whatever he was doing or trying to do. I don't believe in ghosts myself. I grew up very superstitious, but once I grew into adulthood, I didn't think the paranormal explanations made sense. I'm still agnostic to the existence of spirits. Still, paranormal encounter stories excite me, and I love hearing them. I can suspend my disbelief. Anyway, when I was younger, I had a great aunt who was psychic, not the typical kind that read your future or anything. She was a staunch Catholic and basically just new stuff she had no way of knowing. She saw it as a gift from God. To give you an example, one time when my mom was pregnant with my older sister, she experienced some bleeding and went to the hospital. Only she and my dad knew that she was there, but not long after, she received a call from my aunt. What's wrong with the baby? She asked. There's no way that my aunt could have known that anything was wrong or that she was at the hospital. There are more examples of this, but that's the only one I can remember off the top of my head. Her daughters, my mom's cousins, thought. They had a little bit of that gift too, though not as prominently. These relatives lived up in the Adirondacks, and every year during the summer, we used to visit them. I guess when I was around three, we planned another trip up there. But one morning, about a week before the trip, my mom woke up, opened her eyes, and for a split second, saw a white figure at the foot of her bed. She thought it was weird, but said nothing until it happened again and again, and every day for a week. Finally, she told my dad, who froze, and said, I have been seeing that too. Weirded out, they continued with the trip as planned. During a night around a campfire, they told my mom's cousin about it, and her immediate response was, watch your children. Someone's telling you to watch your children. That spooked them, but, but they didn't know what to make of it. Sometime into the trip, we as a family went to the cemetery where my mom's mom was buried to visit graves. I remember none of this, but from what I'm told, I stood with my dad who was a little ways away from my mom and sister. He was busy with something, and I asked where mom was. Over that hill, he told me, and pointed to a small hill in the cemetery. I saw the bigger hill and the road and followed. Eventually, my mom and dad met up again, both asking where I was. Panic set in. My mom suddenly remembered the fireside combo with her cousin. They didn't watch me, and I went missing in the Adirondacks. And they still haven't found me to this day. No, I'm just kidding. After a lot of panicking and searching, they did find me sitting outside a gas station up the road, crying my little eyes out because I'd gone over the wrong hill and gotten lost. Moral of the story, if you see spooky white figures in your room, don't let your toddlers wander around. Graveyards in the mountains. Okay.
I was in a rented house around the age of seven or eight, and I still remember it perfectly. I was in the basement alone, and I know, because every step was loud and creaky. I was building a legal war zone and having some fun, but I turned around to grab some more guys, and at that point, don't laugh or say fake because it really happened, although it sounds a bit stupid. A red object splats the wall next to my head at the speed of light. I mean, not literally, obviously. But I picked up the object, and it was a fruit. Snack. Weird. I think to myself, when I turned around, the two lines of Lego guys facing each other were all facing me. I ran upstairs and couldn't stop shaking. That's what happened to me then with that entity. But there's still more. Now that I'm 14 or 15 years old, my mom finally told me about her experience because she's very superstitious, and she thought the talking about it gave it power. She described a humanoid animal under the stairs that hated adults. She never told anyone but her boyfriend at the time. Only after, he asked about the same creature. Right as they confirmed it was the same thing she told me the power in our house and only around it seemed to go out. I know they sound fake, but that was my first paranormal experience, and I wouldn't lie because it's the first I remember and I won't forget it. Also, my mom saw the same thing, and when she confirmed it, I knew that I wasn't insane or hallucinating. I have several stories of Mexico. It's a place of many myths and legends. This one is one a friend of mine recounted to me about his uncle and his friend who were stuck in a horrifying circumstance. So, my buddy's uncle and his friend were headed home on a highway one night years ago in the state of Oaxaca. You see, they rode in one of those old flatbed trucks that are used to put whatever vegetables or fruits might have been picked that day. They were farmers, as were most of the people in the area, was very rural at the time, and they had only just had a highway installed that was made of actual concrete. As they were returning home, the uncle noticed something in the rearview mirror and made out what seemed to be a horse, about 150 feet away. He couldn't really make out the horse's features and didn't think anything of it until he drifted off to sleep in the passenger seat. As he slept, the uncle had a small nightmare of a horse with large black eyes running up to his passenger side and startling him awake. He did wake up with a start and gathered his bearings. He shook it off thinking it was just a dream. But then he looked over to his buddy that was driving with a terrified look on his face. We were going about 50 miles an hour at the time, which was pretty fast for a truck that size. He said, what are you driving so fast for? and the friend friend responded by saying that they were being followed. He said that for the past couple of miles, the horse in the rear view was slowly inching its way closer and closer to the vehicle. Well, that's when the panic began to settle in. They both felt immense fear wash over them. They sped up to about 65 to try to get away, but the clinking of the hooves of this horse slowly kept getting louder and louder behind them. The one driving said not to turn around and look anymore, to just look straight ahead and not look at the horse, because it seemed to gain on them whenever they glanced back at it. The uncle closed his eyes in fear, only listening, and when the hose inched closer and closer, he glanced to the side of the window. There he saw the large black eyes of the horse from his dream. In real life, looking directly at his friend from the passenger side as it had caught up now, the uncle screamed for his friend not to look and to just go straight and drive fast. Because the horse had a fixated gaze on him. They sped up, all they could, still the horse kept a swift pace, still staring at the driver. When he finally glanced over, he began to cry, overwhelmed with emotion and panic. When the horse suddenly began to slow down, and as it did, the uncle saw that in the rear view once more. Except this time, it had no legs. It was just standing in the road, floating staring at them with its huge black eyes. They told the grandfather of the man driving when they arrived home what they had witnessed, and he told them that the road that was built there 
had gone straight through sacred territory. And they had been lucky to drive past the area at this time of night, because everyone said that they had felt the ground there was salado or salted, meaning it was washed with bad energy, 